Joining today, our visiting professor today is Dr. Zachary Matias Napier from the Sierra Spy Institute in California. And I'll introduce him in greater detail later, but he's going to revisit um, far lateral surgeries and less invasive surgical options in greater detail and specifically a newer evolution of that where we can do surgeries in spine that we traditionally do prone, meaning face down, uh, simultaneously from lateral. So we're going to look at that in some greater detail. And as always, we have some cases. In case you haven't done it, uh, shameless self-advertisement. Last night we had a historic session in our quarterly spine arthroplasty forum. It's on YouTube. We had for the first time ever the three mainstay inventors of spine arthroplasty together in one session. Professor Karin Brittner Jans from Berlin, Germany. She is the co-inventor of the Charité disc. And we had uh, obviously uh, 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 Pierre Marnet, uh, Thierry, sorry, Thierry Marnet, I always say Pierre, Thierry Marnet from Montpellier, France, uh, with the ProDisc L perspective. And um, uh, we had um, Dr. Who, who was the third speaker here last night? Oh yeah, Rolanda Garcia from the Active L uh, background. Thank you. Uh, so all three were together for the first time ever, and that was a, an amazing session. We were in the OR. We had it actually on a live background feed because we're still operating. But uh, go to YouTube and check out those three, and the discussions between the three of them are priceless. We welcome our colleagues from uh, Tacoma here, and uh, it'll be a great session. As always, we'll kick it off uh, with some uh, live case discussions, with hopefully lively discussions. Um, and Dr. Napier will have the microphone hot and activated to provide um, uh, feedback as our other colleagues. Without much further ado, we'll start with a very simple case. Um, and Dr. Mauricio Avila was so kind to put that together uh, last night. Uh, Mauricio is going to go to St. Louis University, and he's here from the University of Arizona. Mauricio, thank you. Thank you. OK, good morning, everyone. <clears throat> so this is a 56-year-old female who presented to our uh, outpatient spine clinic with complaints of low back pain for the past two, three years. Uh, the pain radiates to the bilateral lower extremities and in, in her left groin. She said for the past six months before seeing us in clinic, the, the pain was getting worse, limiting her daily activities. She's quite active. And, um, and she said, you know, this, this pain is, is not becoming tolerable anymore. She tried activity modification, CBD oil, LSO braids. She had a Peloton bicycle uh, that she keep using, but she had minimal relief from her back pain from this. Uh, no relevant past surgical history. She has ADHD. Uh, you can see there on the, on the boxes, she had a normal neuro exam and she had a normal weight, normal BMI in her case. This is her MRI, and then you can see there at, at four or five, she has a, a, I will call it grade one, spondylolisthesis. And that's the, the, the axial cut is through her disc, which I think will be uh, useful for discussion later. This is her uh, CT. Uh, I just put, you know, bilateral pars are intact, so this is a, a you know, just a degen spond, it's not a, a Lithic spondy. Uh, you can see the loss of this space and the, the changes on the end plate as well on the CT. Uh, the coronal one, I try, uh, you, you'll see on the x ray, I try to also, that's the cut, so you can see the iliac crest as well. And this is our flexion extension. I hope it projects well. It basically doesn't move on flexion extension, it's a, it's a fixed grade one spondy. And I think this one, the coronal, you can see a little bit better. or ill crest to the level of the disc. So she exhausted everything non-surgical. Uh, she's in the clinic and she said she cannot tolerate this anymore. So I think this is the first point of discussion. So this is a... Are you... We're good? Okay, good morning. Thank you, Mauricio. So this is, there are no tricks to this case. This is a professional. She is very well maintained. Uh, she has a very successful business. Uh, she is taking superb care of herself. If you don't mind going back to the lateral flexion extension films, there are no tricks to this. This is a very common thing. There's no ist mixed spondy 
This is a grade one, I would almost call it grade two, but that's arguable, kyphotically malaligned um, uh, degenerative spondy at four or five. She has no osteoporosis. We actually checked that with bone densities. I forgot the numbers, but assume there's none there. She's very health conscientious. And here she is. The foramen are very tight, so they're squashed, but she has no neurologic deficits. We'll start with the visiting professor. Zach, you're here to talk about PTP. Is this an ideal candidate for PTP? I wouldn't say this is an ideal candidate. I uh, wouldn't do this as your first PTP case. Um, this is, uh, you know, as you mentioned, a very common clinical scenario, uh, grade one to two degenerative spondylolisthesis, foraminal stenosis with radiculopathy. Uh, you know, I know that although this was referred to as fixed, I think we can see on the flex X that uh, there is some angulation on the CT scan. There's air in the disc. Uh, I think there, there's certainly some motion there and, and presumably a dynamic component where she feels worse when she's standing up than she does lying down. Uh, this is a great case because you could ask 10 spine surgeons and you, and you might get seven or eight different answers. Um, I think the, the goal of the operation would be to stabilize uh, the L45 level and also to decompress the neuroforamen uh, and I would also add that given the focal kyphosis at L45, I'd like to improve her sagittal alignment, uh, restoring lordosis uh, in a physiologically appropriate location. So I think any surgical technique that achieves those three goals uh, would be a reasonable option. So uh, you pointed out the goals of surgery beautifully, the how. You also identified that we have a quandary of uh, plurality of opinions. Um, the deformity correction in terms of uh, kyphosis correction. So Dr. Hart is here, uh, ISSG member. Bob, so every fusion surgery is a deformity surgery, even a single level, right? So how many degrees lordosis would you want to have at four or five and how can we achieve that best in your opinion? Well, I, as I was uh, initially looking at this, I was leaning towards not doing an inner body and not restoring height of that disc. Um, and looking at this, I actually think, yeah, that it wouldn't be a bad option. I mean, the, the, I think it's important, and I, I appreciated uh, Dr. Napier's discussion uh, very much, very much, but um, uh, the, 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 why do we do an inner body? So one reason is it increases fusion rate. Eh, don't think I really am worried about a one level fusion. Uh, healing with just pedicle screws, let's say. What else? Uh, well, um, we we like it to perhaps assist in decompression, direct posterior decompression, no problem. Um, what else? We like it for uh, for the structural anterior column support. Don't need it here because the disc is fully collapsed. So what are we left with? Well, restoring lordosis. Eh, okay, I buy on. Um, and because that is, I'd say it's about zero. I wouldn't call it kyphotic. I'd call it neutral, at least on that middle segment uh, panel there. Yeah, I know it moves a little, but it's unstable. It needs fusion, but it's not very kyphotic. That's all I'm saying. So um, you asked how much do you need? I think, you know, ideally we'd like to have five to seven degrees, let's say through the four or five disc space. And uh, I do agree with your comment, uh, you know, a lot of times if we do a fusion in a, in a poor orientation, we're starting a cascade of problems that becomes a real deformity. So uh, certainly wouldn't want to see that happen for this lady, but I, I'm not 100% convinced that I need an inner body to do that. So that's my long answer. All right, we'll go to our Tacoma colleagues, Dr. Covey or Dr. Martin, who wants to go first? So you've heard a couple of options. I'm sure you get barraged with uh, patient requests on a simple case like this. I'm sure from your wealth of experience, you have formed your own preferred opinions. What would your suggestion be on this patient? I, I certainly agree. I think a posterolateral fusion or T lift would be both very reasonable. Um, and I, the nice, I, I personally would feel more comfortable doing a foraminal decompression uh, with a T lift, and that's just uh, really easy. That's the main advantage. In a patient who doesn't have any radiculopathy, I think both are very reasonable options. Uh, but. Um, so if, it, if you don't have to do a decompression, I would just do a postural fusion. Uh, and if you say, well, you know, her groin pain may have something to do with that L4 foraminal narrowing, uh, I would just, uh, for that reason alone, I would do a T-lift. Uh, so posterior 
single midline incision or MIS yes. Yes. tube single poster midline. lateral wiltsy okay. your partner does your partner agree uh, yeah I, they don't have a lot to add, add to the, to the theories of the goals I would go for the inner body fusion <clears throat> I think that restoring that height and restoring some more doses is probably going to protect that l34 level which is kind of looking a little bit uh, worn out <clears throat> Can you get closer um, but I think that it's perfectly reasonable to not do it. Um, I would do a T lift, uh, open midline incision, uh, direct decompression, um, and uh, put an expandable cage. A aim for you know five to eight degrees of lower doses. That level is never as much as the cage says it's going to be. Uh, but um, you know she's got good sclerotic end plates. I think it'll hold. You know, pack a lot of uh, bone in there and uh, the pedicle screws bilaterally. Um, my experience has been these folks do great. They tend to feel better within hours of the surgery um, with that amount of support and, and low doses restored. Join passing one microphone off to Rod. So, Rod, you're one of the originators yeah. of um, uh, XLIF or far lateral surgeries. So, this is a very well preserved uh, mid 50s successful businesswoman, yeah. normal bone density. Is this still a great case for a far lateral approach? Can yeah, you get I mean, a nice I think deformity can, reduction. I think you can. Uh, I think lateral is good. It's a little, you know, when you look at like um, the literature and in our experience with grade two spondies, it gets a little trickier. Um, this seems like it it moves, um, but you know the thing I worry about is uh, the plexus. So you know if you're going to dock uh, on the fifty yard line here, you're going to be pretty posterior. So that is uh, femoral nerve injury is, is, um, is a concern. Mauricio, on that axial MRI, which you uh, smartly put up with your uh, uh, marker, can you show us where the plexus lies relative to the psoas? It's and actually going to be over here. Is this one of those Mickey Mouse ear psoas that you're worried about? I will, to me, yeah, when you know, we read about it and we talk about it, to me this looks like a Mickey Mouse psoas. I mean, there's so much space here between the actual muscle belly and your this space that I'll be worried. You'd be worried. University of Arizona has some very cool MIS and semi-open surgeons. What would your attendings have done? Uh, this will be a all posterior, just to lift. Just simple open? Even or, though well, Dr. Chua will do robotics. You know, one of the other attendings, Dr. Mon, we may do with some MIS. OK. So Dr. Napier, visiting professor, this is a businesswoman. She has no nonsense. And that's the fact. She's going to put you on the spot. You gave a lot of cool kind of all the good principles were reviewed, but now she wants to know what is your recommendation? I guess businesswoman is uh, better than her being an interpreter. <laughs> closer to the microphone. Uh, you got to get closer to the microphone. Yeah. All right. Um, is this? Yeah. No, yeah. Okay, fine. great. Um, so, yeah, looking at this case, uh, like, um, like I mentioned earlier, it, it's not ideal. This is not a textbook uh, case where you want to do your first lateral. Uh, the, the Mickey Mouse psoas element refers to an, an anterior positioning of the psoas muscle uh, rather than its uh, typical station at L45, which would be right, right in line with the psoas or uh, with the disc space. Now, um, I'll, I'll show a case that's very similar to this uh, l later, uh, but I, I would say that this is, is doable. Um, from a lateral position, uh, there are some elements of prone uh, prone lateral that would facilitate this uh, case, but you should have a, a T lift on backup, um, and and the patient should understand that your decision to proceed with the operation safely will be based on your intraoperative mapping of the lumbar plexus, and if you have a safe corridor, it, you can go cautiously, uh, but again. In this situation, there's also much to be said for why uh, why even uh, enter that realm of decision making or risk and and just perform a, a gold standard uh, T lift, and and the patient would do fine as well. So this patient came to me with a, a funny context in that she had seen three area surgeons who all wanted to have or give her MIS surgeries. So through some abdominal or far lateral approaches and uh, percutaneous screw fixation on the back, MIS to 
create less pain for her. I was actually surprised about that. There was almost, I mean, we had a pretty nice diverse discussion here, but there was almost, and I'm not revealing their identities, unanimity in terms of how to proceed in this surgery. And they all told her, you'll be in the hospital probably for one night and go home. Drum roll, what do we do? No big surprise here. So we did a, <clears throat> sorry, all posterior midline with uh, uh, bilateral expandable cages. Uh, the way, I, I was in this case, but the way Dr. Chapman does it is complete facetectomy bilateral. I think that helps with the uh, disc space spreader and restoring the disc height, plus, of course, the expandable cages. Uh, she stayed in the hospital, in our hospital, like a day and a half, um, almost two days, and then went home. So the one screw looks a little bit funky, but we had to actually redirect that. That's one of the problems of an IDO at the same level, because again, you take off the upper end of the end plate. So we had to redirect that screw, but she's neurologically normal. We could put it in directly. But she stayed in the hospital for a night, and she's now at her three-month mark plus doing very well. So any thoughts? I mean, Rod, this is a single open procedure with a block. She mobilized hours after the surgery. She had no neurologic consequences. So very, you know how IDOs work. And disc glasteotomies yeah I mean I think it's a good approach but I think sometimes you know um, I mean even with this approach you know you look at five one and and you know is it is it too much for the next level or adjacent level you know um, uh, but I think you know uh, uh, you got a good reduction and uh, good that looks like the frame is open yeah would you have done it similarly uh, yours for instance would you have done that similarly you have to speak closer to my uh, I, I would not have done the osteotomy, I think, um, but um, I mean, it's <clears throat> the, the only thing that potentially uh, to be a little bit concerned about that, you know, is this, you know, with uh, Mike's mentioned this L3-4 level above and now you've created, of course, a very rigid block. Uh, will that actually cause more problems up there? But uh, I don't think there's an, uh, as opposed to a postolateral fusion. Karin Bittner-Jans last night gave a very cool discussion about what do our discs actually do. And I uh, was surprised to show or to hear her speak about, uh, it's actually not so much of a damper, meaning a cushion, it's actually a shear adapter. And the shear forces increase when you have a fusion at one level. So I was not totally aware of that. She showed some pretty compelling slides to suggest that. Mauricio, any thoughts on her as you reviewed that case? No, I mean, I was, I was, I was thinking last night. I mean, as everybody said, this is a very common scenario, and you know, as we approach me becoming an attending, if I have this, why do I do it? And I think just because of my training in Arizona and here, probably will be a posterior tilif. The the thing I feel more comfortable treating this. Yeah. The, the big question is open or MIS. Yeah. And what would you do? <laughs> I will try MIS. Multiple poke holes. Okay. All right. You don't like the muscle, right? I, I, I just had to say it so you feel all worked up. Good. All right. Excellent. Now let's look at a different perspective. So we have a, and I'll make not a big query about that. Thank you very much, Mauricio. Uh, we have an oncologic case, and let's explore how we can restore a deficient anterior column. And this is Dr. Jared Cook. Are you going to show that case? or Yeah. Yep. I am. Okay. So. This is a 51-year-old uh, male uh, military mechanic, um, uh, works on uh, helicopters. Uh, he came in reporting uh, of abdominal pain. Uh, he had low back pain complaints uh, that you know, were, were increasing. He was being treated uh, at the VA um, you know, for that. So comes in, endorses fevers, chills, sweats, uh, subjective urinary retention, but uh, the PVR was uh, only 50 cc's in the ED, um, you know, largely uh, Neurologically intact, just some uh, uh, pain-related, uh, like pain-related uh, left lower extremity, um, you know, deficit. Uh, ESR CRP, uh, this, uh, these numbers are actually a little off, but CRP was uh, was actually uh, 35, um, and uh, uh, white count was not elevated. So. Um, Imaging when they uh, when they scan them initially got a chest abdomen or they got an abdomen pelvis uh, CT and then after uh, you know seeing this they uh, uh, got the dedicated spine formatted for us and uh, this is what we saw so there's a this uh, lytic lesion of uh, L2 uh, it's taking you know about two thirds uh, to three quarters of the vertebral body involves um, you know the uh, uh, left-sided pedicle and, and some posterior elements. It uh, tracks into the psoas as well. Um, the 
uh, MRI um, also, you know, also shows this. So you can see kind of the magnitude of this. Um, and then, uh, you know, just from just, you know, for alignment purposes, um, you know, showing you the scouts from the CT, there are no, uh, there are no plain x-rays. Um, uh, there were at this point, um, you know, we see that his, the issue that he's having is a pathologic fracture at L2 uh, with extension into that psoas. Um, and at the time um, they were, uh, you know, they were considering potential infection versus neoplasm bleeding much more heavily toward neoplasm. Um, so should we see what other, what people would suggest? Right, and maybe we can go back to the CT scan. Did you calculate the SIN score? Do you know what the SIN score was? I think it's in our notes. Uh, it's in our notes, but it was intermediate like it usually is. Yeah, so intermediate SIN score. Um, no focal neurology, but the patient can mobilize, fair, and has a subjective urinary all, retention. All pain related, yes. Yeah. So it can mobilize, not particularly obese, uh, unresolved infection versus oncologic disease here. Um, any thoughts? So the age-old question, and we can fast track that, uh, Dr. Napier, do we wait for a biopsy and uh, uh, wait until that comes back to look for round cell disease versus infection, or do we say this is a structurally compromised vertebra, let's just get the show on the road? I uh, forgot to tell you, he has a history of uh, prior MRSA infection uh, times two and no oncologic history. Uh, that's a good question. Uh, he, he was not pr presenting with uh, any profound neurologic deficit. I think he had some hip flexor weakness. Um, certainly his inability to mobilize due to pain as well as the uh, ominous findings of a lytic lesion encompassing three, three quarters of the vertebral body. Uh, would lean us more toward uh, early stabilization, but I don't think that our hand is absolutely forced here. Uh, if this could be some type of uh, lesion that's extremely sensitive uh, to chemotherapy or, or radiotherapy, uh, it, it may be worthwhile to to get a biopsy uh, beforehand. Uh, admittedly, I don't, I don't do a ton of <laughs> tumor in my practice, but I'm just trying to recall some principles. Uh, Michael, you also want to talk about this. So this is a very common condition. Again, we see far more uh, lytic lesions, whether it's infections. I mean, we've published on that a couple of years ago in Spine. The, the numbers are skyrocketing, and that's not an exaggeration. Far more oncologic diseases, usually metastatic in the spine. Uh, thoughts on, do you play the slow wait for a biopsy, which nowadays takes about a week to come back when you have uh, genotyping involved? Or do you want to just go for it and say this this is unstable? This guy will not get out of bed. I mean, he's well. It's clearly unstable. I mean, he needs to be fixed. I think for me, the question is just about timing. Um, I think this is probably not an infection. Um, I would try to get something uh, before operating on him, uh, just to make it. You know, how aggressive am I going to be with that? soft tissue mass i mean does it need you know to be significantly debulked or is it something that's going to melt away with with radiation and chemo and in which case you just need to go in and do a decompression my guess is his hip flexor weakness is due to the fact that it's invading his psoas and uh it just hurts to flex his hip because of the mass effect so i would opt for you know making him comfortable you know try to you know maybe get a frozen section or something that can you know point it in the right direction do the full you know, blood work up to make sure it's not one of the something that'll show up on his blood. But, you know, he clearly needs an operation. It's just a matter of the timing. I wouldn't rush in and, you know, do him emergently or even urgently. I'd try to get an answer first. And what is what rules do you follow? Maybe he also wants to take that. Do you do the two above, two below rule if you think this is uh, infectious or uh, you do less invasive surgeries? Would there be a role for percutaneous surgeries? We've had a local a group of surgeons do these MIS somehow. I'm not sure that right. that's successful. Yeah, uh, I think um, thoracic, I tend to go more three and three, but two and two is, I think, is very reasonable. The only, I think it makes sense to wait and, um, you know, of course, you, it's easy to get a CT, chest, abdomen, pelvis, do your blood work. So, you, you know, if it's a kidney tumor, you'd like to know in advance and maybe you have them go for embolization. Um, in somebody with just as quad weakness like this person, you know, pain control should not be that much of an issue if he's in the hospital. Uh, so it, I don't see there's a reason to rush your, you know, if you want to do gene, genetic phenotyping, whatever, you, that may take a week, but I would say there's probably a good chance you'll get a 
if you, most places you can get a CT guided biopsy on the next day or the same day, so. Yeah, we obviously, I want to emphasize Dr. Covey's point. We did full neural access um, uh, scanning and body scanning. And again, there were no other lesions. So this is a solitary uh, thing. And again, Jared, do you mind using your cursor to show the C versus the I component? Not that there's a real C here, but what would an infection look like uh, typically if you look at the sagittal or the coronals? So the if you know if you're looking at infection, you'd you'd expect it to you know be able to go through uh, through the disc as opposed to you know tumor, which you know may go more around and not involve it. Bingo, yeah. So the end plates on the affected vertebra have been destroyed, but the uh, the uh, end plates of the vertebra above and below have not been destroyed. And again, this is for me always a hallmark, and this is an age-old thing. I just want to the younger generation somehow don't know the obvious or aren't taught that properly anymore. So I think this is always helpful for me. You've been taught, you're the exception. Some, some younger surgeons, not you. Okay, so let's, let's uh, in the interest of time, jump forward with this. So okay. what was done? Um, so, the, uh, so the plan was, um, so along with that, uh, you know, that full, uh, full workup, all of that you know, was of course done. Um, so a two-stage procedure, um, posterior fusion with uh, cemented screws from uh, L1 to L3 with as much tumor resection um, from posterior as, uh, as possible, you know, deep bulking, and stage two, uh, you know, lateral, uh, finish the deep bulking and, uh, you know, corpectomy, get a, a nice big cage in there. And then you know biopsy at the at the same time. So I'll tell you that a frozen section suggested that this was a a uh, plasma cell um, uh, tumor. Um, here is the uh, here's the post op CT. Um, I think alignment is even better than it was uh, you know than it was prior. And here are uh, you know here are plain films. So. Then going from there, you know, given given what everything you know looked like, so the additional workup that was done here, Neuralax MRIs, nothing else was there. Chest abdomen pelvis showed nothing. Um, the labs were, you know, again, um, you know, consistent with a, a plasma cell origin. Um, uh, the patient after this, um, you know, was discovered uh, did have a skeletal survey. There's a, a couple of lytic lesions in the uh, the skull and uh, distal clavicle, and eventually, with uh, oncology, had a bone marrow biopsy. Um, so, has been uh, officially diagnosed with uh, multiple myeloma uh, at this point, um, and is uh, um, uh, seeing radiation oncology. So, if you can go back to the lesions, so. Um... Rod, you were so kind to lend your expertise to the corpectomy part. If you can go forward to the post-op of CT scan. So we, we did a very careful exposure and had pathology there and uh, got the affirmation that this is a round cell disease. Um, and based on that, we limited our uh, fixation to just one above, one below. And we did a bilateral laminectomy and basically a, uh, a bilateral significant tumor debulking to make your life easier. The point is with a far lateral procedure, do you think that you'd be comfortable to do a significant um, uh, in-canal tumor resection, including PLL resection above and below, so that you have a clean margin to help the radiation oncologists? Or, I mean, I think in this case, we knew it was, uh, you know, myeloma. so. You know, you can't really, I think radiation is, is going to, radiation and follow-up, um, you know, you're not going to, that's why we didn't go crazy on taking every piece out. Yeah, I didn't um, mention the second stage was yeah. uh, about a week later. Yeah, and so knowing that, I think, you know, we weren't as aggressive trying to take every piece out because I do think long-term these patients um, uh, with that much metal in there, I think, you know, you just still need to get a fusion. Um, getting the posterior longitudinal ligament, I think, um, it's much easier to get it from the back, but certainly, you know, you can get it from the front. You just basically turn the retractor uh, the opposite way and point posteriorly, which I've done a lot. But it's much easier, I think, the way we do it, where you go in posterior, clean up the, do a lamy, take out the PLL, and do a partial corpectomy, and then I go in from the front and um, uh, do an inner body fusion. So, Dr. Hart, the um, usual convention is, as Dr. Covey said, two above, two below, or more for oncologic diseases. We just did uh, one a level above and below cement augmented screws. Is that a legitimate approach? Is there any literature evidence for that? Well, you're putting me on the spot asking about literature, but uh, my gut says it's okay uh, if that qualifies. So, um, 
uh, I think, you know, this is a nice application that you, if you're going to do, I was thinking actually, as we were showing the case, I might limit it to just one above one below, I think for a lumbar lesion, uh, that's, uh, that's a reasonable approach. I, I certainly think the surgical indication here is reasonable. This gentleman clearly has a, a long-term life expectancy. Uh, you know, this is, I guess you could say it's analogous to a, an elderly patient coming in with a fractured hip if they can't mobilize while you're waiting a week for the pathology, I, I think that becomes the surgical indication. And uh, and I would say with respect to the biomechanics, if we're going to limit to one level, then doing an uh, anterior uh, structural graft uh, makes very good sense. And this is one area, I think, in the time that I've been out in practice, the development of the, you know, first the percutaneous um, exliff approach, and now with the anterior to psoas type approach has really been transformative. I mean, back in the day when we came out, this kind of corpectomy work was very morbid through an open approach. And to be able to do it with a very limited uh, exposure, I think, has been an, an enormous clinical improvement. I want to second that the uh, morbidity of the lateral approach, in this case, at this upper level, and Dr. Skuin's hands was uh, near nil. I mean, he almost didn't notice that. he. He did mobilize much better, but it was a battle. Uh, he'd been literally laying in bed for uh, well over a week or two. And uh, this is what prompted our indication for surgery. I mean, yes, we obviously usually follow um, uh, guidelines, but this man, despite the TLSO, was not getting out of bed. And he was in such misery. Now, Dr. Napier, so this is a application of a far lateral procedure, and that was done in supplement to a open posterior conventional procedure. Is this something that uh, is amenable towards a simultaneous prone uh, far lateral, especially at this upper level? Um, would this be something that you'd be comfortable uh, promulgating for the future? I'll, I'll discuss this uh, a little later in my presentation. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll discuss this a little later in my presentation, but uh, th this is a case where I would still approach this from the lateral decubitus position. Uh, I, th I think one major benefit of lateral decubitus uh, and it may relate a lot to retractor technology actually is increased anterior visualization um, and increased ability to perform canal decompression and, and, and anterior canal work. So uh, for me, this is a, I would approach this exactly the same way. I do a lateral decubitus corpactomy um, in terms of posterior fixation. I think the answer to that question is completely dependent on the strength of your anterior column fixation. This is, uh, a robust cage with uh, wide end plates that that span the apophyseal ring. Uh, this is very stable up front, and so so uh, I would do a lateral decubitus uh, corpectomy, uh, just as uh, Dr. Oskuin did, and then uh, I think one up, one down is, is sufficient. That's that's a robust cage he's got in there. All right, and yeah, thank you for that discussion. So he actually did quite well. He's up and moving, and it was a battle because he had become so. Um, traumatized by his uh, period of recumbence that uh, getting him up was actually quite a Herculean effort, but it, stability does matter. And again, once he regained the trust and his posterior fixation, he actually did better. But we usually do these pretty rapidly after yeah. one another. And in his case, we just had to wait for his emotional wellness to uh, improve. Jared, any thoughts from you and as you observe this case? No, I mean, I think this is, uh, I think this is, you know, really, really well done, you know, good indication. I, I think, uh, you know, limiting the number of levels, um, you know, based on his, his bone quality, his age, his, you know, lack of comorbidities, I, I think, um, you know, makes a lot of sense. Um, so, I mean, I, I can't really poke any holes in anything that I'm seeing. So I'm going to poke holes in uh, ourselves, and I'll include Rod in that. We put a lot of titanium in there. This is obviously a radiosensitive lesion, but Rod, why would you use a titanium cage and not a uh, peak or a graphite or carbon cage? I mean, that's a good question. I, I don't think there's a right answer. Um, I think, um, you know, there's you can make an argument of why even do surgery on a patient like this, you know? Uh, and I, I don't have the answer to it, but I think... Um, I think stereotactic radiation has changed the game. I think this patient is probably still going to get probably standard radiation because unfortunately insurance companies still won't pay for upfront um, uh, IMRT or any of these, you know, stereotactic radiation um, te technologies. But I think it's, I, don't, I don't know the answer to that. Yeah. Good. 
All right. So next case, Dr. Cook also, he was kind enough to prepare two cases. Dr. Seidel and the OR was going to present one, but he's taking on both. So thank you, Jared. All right. So uh, this other one, um, patient, a 40-year-old male with uh, Down syndrome, comes in with low back pain. Um, it's uh, nonverbal, um, but... Uh, uh, you know, very, uh, very interactive. Um, he initially had fallen from a six foot high structure about nine months prior and then became progressively, you know, less functional, uh, started, you know, started kind of leaning forward. Um, and now uh, at this point, you know, a presentation is ambulating in a, in a wheelchair, um, but, you know, without any, any notable neurologic deficits. Um, he had x-rays at an outside hospital and uh, they, uh, you know, read it as a, quote, possible pathologic fracture of L4. Um, so this was biopsied and it didn't show any neoplasm or infection. So on, uh, you know, on physical exam, uh, you know, uh, weaker absent reflexes, um, you know, not cooperative with examination. So, um, you know, that's largely limited, but um, as I said, he's, he's very, uh, very interactive and, you know, and moves uh, all four extremities seemingly with, uh, with good strength. Um, so that's what we had to go on. Um, and at this point, uh, this is what the uh, x-rays look like. You can kind of, you know, see what the uh, alignment was. The CT will show you better what we're, you know, kind of dealing with, um, you know, including this, uh, you know, focal kyphosis, uh, you know, um, uh, also the bridging callus um, that, you know, that we're dealing with. So it's trying to, it's trying to heal, but there's a, uh, an osteonecrotic um, uh, component, um, you know, to, uh, to this process as well. Um, here's, uh, here's what we see on the, um, uh, on the MRI. Um, so, you know, some canal stenosis, but, uh, uh, you know, not, not complete nerve root occlusion. Um, and so we're just kind of showing, uh, you know, right through, uh, right through behind the vertebral body and through the, uh, the disc space just above. So this is um, so go a here. twist on a neglected burst fracture treatment um, in a special needs um, young male with an amazing mother who is very cued into every aspect of this uh, young man's life and he is functionally deteriorated so she gives a very credible account that he's just not doing anything anymore and he used to roam the neighborhood and now he's basically sitting at home uh, with repetitive movements in a forward bent fashion and she feels that he's ailing this is obviously a difficult discussion to have but just if we concentrate on the fracture now leaving the uh, the developmental aspects out of consideration. Uh, Dr. Martin, you talked about expandable cages earlier. Is this powerful enough to kind of resurrect the anterior column if you decide to do surgery? And it's just mechanically speaking. Uh, I can give you, oh yeah, you have a microphone. Uh, would expandable cage technology that has been such a revolution in so many ways be powerful enough to overcome that kyphosis? I think so. Um, it's either that or you know, do it the old school and, you know, distract the hell out of it open and try to jam a section of femur in there. Um, uh, but yeah, I think that you could get pretty good reduction in lower doses, but obviously needs, you know, anterior column support and uh, his bone quality is probably good. So um, might get away with, you know, good contact and good support up front. Uh, get by with uh, one level above and one level below. So, okay, wow, yeah. Um, Rod's not here. We've had these left-right discussions many, many times. The callus is on the left side. Dr. Napier, would you go in from the left side and kind of take that apart with a trans approach to minimize trauma to the patient, or would you do what Dr. Hart likes to do and go from a pre psoas approach here to kind of get that lateral and anterior tether out? I think this can be done from a trans psoas approach um, to focally kyphotic uh, burst fracture non-union uh, with presumably decent bone above and below. Um, I think there are a lot of considerations of being trans psoas at, at L4. I know Dr. Oskuyan is uh, very well known for that. Uh, I've done this at L3. I have not done this at L4, but uh, technique-wise, I would essentially just do a standard X-lift at L3-4 and then do a standard X lift at L45 um, with, with provisional cages. So I'd have, have all that work done. And then I would dock my retractor um, mid-body 
uh, take the segmental and, and perform the corpectomies to minimize retractor time. But I think in this, I, I would probably go in from the right side. Uh, is it, the right side is the left side of the screen? I the would, left side is the left side. So, so yeah, the right side of the screen. So the callus is on uh, the patient's would, left side. From the, from the other side of left the callus. Side. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. Because Dr. Oskurian, he's sadly had to step out, uh, almost militantly comes in from the left side. So uh, for some reasons. I, I, I look at the vascular anatomy more, but it looked pretty safe if I can uh, recall. There was a nice play. So Dr. Hart, you're, uh, for the sake of argument, you're very um, enamored with pre-SOAS approaches. And uh, tell us why and why would you not want to, oh, thanks, uh, Jared, that's great. Uh, uh, editorial picture, uh, pictures there. Why do you not like going uh, through the psoas? And again, that psoas goes pretty far anterior there. So tell us uh, why you prefer, and I'm not going to use the company endorsed acronym, why do you like to go before the, in front of the psoas? Well, um, you know, the, the my experience with the first generation, which if we're not going to name it, I think we all know what we're talking about, of trans psoas approaches, uh, I had great success at 2, 3, and 3, 4. Uh, I had early, relatively early in my experience, a fairly dense femoral nerve palsy at uh, 4, 5, despite having clean uh, stims and, and visualization uh, that there was no uh, crossing nerve root. And, and uh, I remember following that, I sort of stopped doing, I stopped doing the 4, 5 level uh, for sure. And uh, I remember a, some meeting that it was being discussed and I was uh, at the podium and kind of queried the audience and, you know, how many had seen that. And a really hefty percentage of hands went up. And, and then I asked where, uh, anyone that has seen femoral nerve palsy uh, was the level 4, 5, and it was essentially the same number of hands. So I think at... At that level, it is treacherous uh, potentially to try to cross the psoas. So I describe the approach I use now as more anterior trans psoas or trans anterior psoas. So I'm still uh, not that worried about taking some of the very anterior fibers, but coming in obliquely, uh, docking uh, either immediately in front or just barely into the body of the psoas, I think is, is typically safe. And, and that's how I've modified the, the technique in my own uh, practice. And can I say one further editorial thing that, uh, for the fellows, if they're still listening, um, you know, this, this history is kind of a classic and, and it turns out that, the, you know, there's a number of uh, patients uh, with developmental delay or, or uh, mental disabilities uh, that end up with significant spinal problems. And, and this is one example. And, and I think you said it's a neglected burst fracture. The reason it's neglected is because this, uh, this pa patient could not communicate uh, what he was experiencing and get appropriate care. And in my practice, uh, these have been some of the most uh, satisfying and gratifying cases to take care of. Uh, they also don't arrive in our offices without uh, some kind of a structural family strong support system uh, uh, and uh, that's where a lot of the gratification comes is in uh, taking care of the patient and seeing the reaction of the family to getting their patient back uh, to close to their baseline. Very well said. Do you mind going back to that CT rod? We talked about left versus right. He has a large callus on the left. You may remember this patient. Yeah. Why do you like to go from the left so much? And would it make more sense in this case, if you leave any yeah. of your personal preferences of left versus right aside, to go in from the concave side with a large callus to take that apart or come from the convex side where there's less callus? Um, I think, I mean, I just prefer to go from the left. Um, I think you go either way on this one. Um, and you know with breaking the table i think it'll be equal regardless of the side you go on so you're not that fixated on no <clears throat> so and concave versus convex i used matter. to care but i i just like i just go from the left okay yeah all right jared what do we do and what snags did we hit in the road okay so another two stager um, started off uh, going uh, posteriorly, um, uh, L2 to pelvis posterior fusion with a quad rod construct and uh, you know, decompression um, at that stenotic level. And then stage two is a lateral corpectomy. These were uh, within a couple of days of each other. Um, so uh, here is um, here's the uh, end result of stage one. Um, so a significant amount of corpectomy was done uh, you know, from, uh, from posteriorly. Uh, and have a you know nice strong construct to support it in the meantime, and uh, 
uh, at the corpectomy level, it's just a, a short screw for a little additional support. And then, um, uh, then the uh, corpectomy and lateral cage was done um, was done just uh, just a few days later, and so. So I, I, if I can interrupt you for a second, uh, we kind of used the VSO, a vertebral subtraction osteotomy principle from posterior. And I have to say, this was very, very hard to get this deformity correction. I, I was surprised, disappointed in myself. I worked, as I said, I'll reemphasize that, very, very hard to get these teeth apart. I could not believe how tenacious this was. And I've done a lot of VSOs, PSOs, et cetera. This was... I don't know. There was a lot of tethering there, so we untethered as good as we could, and I was surprised I did not get more low doses. But it's not for a want of trying. Well, because you did that, lateral was uh, was significantly easier than I think it otherwise would have been. Still a struggle. But um, so, do you have any memories of that, Rod? Uh, yeah, getting the cage in. I, this I, is not fun, right? I remember you. Uh, having um a difficult time reducing it but our part went really smoothly because you did such a great job in your series that you published uh, i think it was in world neurosurgery corpectomies versus two level um x lifts uh, sorry i said the name but um uh interdiscal uh, cages was there a difference of neurologic uh, deficits yeah i mean the comp yeah significantly higher complication rate with corpectomies yeah yeah like to what tune? So, what do you tell patients now for corpectomy as the main leading uh, presentation, and uh, how does that compare to a standard far lateral approach? Um, I think, I mean, the the main complications we had were um, neurologic. So, I think um, you know retractor positioning, retractor time, and I think with neuromonitoring getting better, I I think um, you know mapping the plexus and and where you where you place your retractor is important too so so philosophically a lot of far lateral surgeons have suggested to do the corpectomy first and then do percutaneous screws in the back could you in theory uh, assuming that i didn't putz around conceive doing this deformity reduction from anterior only and then doing percutaneous screws posteriorly you could um i've done that before um i think you can do it either way yeah, I honestly yeah. think you, even in your hands, yeah. this would have not worked. Yeah, yeah. Because this, uh, the amount of yeah, it looked like it was pretty ankylosed. So yeah, the amount of yeah. bony dissection uh, and release. And work. I've done that where you go in, you can't get it. You go in from the back, then you come back in. Yeah, yeah. So it, that's happened to me. I mean, the big thing was just yeah. you know the chronicity. It, things were just scarred down. So you know, like despite what you know you were able to do from the back, but the scar was there. Once you got through the scar, it all was you know was easier. But I couldn't imagine if uh, if you had to you know get through that callus um, you know as well as the mm -hmm. first stage. So let's look at the end result. Okay. So um, that point, patient was uh, was doing very well clinically. Um, you know, uh, mother who, as previously stated, is a rock star. Um, uh, you know, very supportive. So he's um, you know he's getting around, but starting to uh, pitch forward again, and then. Um, you know, this is uh, this is what we see. So we can um, you know see on that uh, CT scan on the left that you know is uh, you know aligned. But then once uh, he gets on standing films, so there is some uh, some kyphosis just above the yeah. uh, uh, just above the construct. Um, so at that point, he was just uh, you know followed, and um, you know despite that, uh, getting around still much better than he was uh, previously. And the uh, um, after you know, discussion with uh, with the mother and um, uh, a lot of following just being monitored right now. So he's roaming the neighborhood again. So he returned to his pre injury status. And obviously, we've seen this with some concern. His hospital stay was like about a month or so. Um, and for no particular reason, it was just very difficult to communicate and get him better. Our hospital administrators will have not been happy with me probably, but uh, I think we did a very nice thing. Uh, we decided against doing a longer fusion because again, there seemed to be no discernible burden on his part from the mother's perception and himself. Dr. Martin, do, would you treat the x-rays over um, the patient or do you think observation is fine there so far? I'm looking for validation here. Yeah, I don't treat x-rays. I mean, I think you got to look at the patient and treat him clinically. I uh, would probably have done the, almost certainly do the same thing. Yeah.
The L2 vertebra is, and uh, the longer I do this, is a very vulnerable vertebra if you go to the pelvis, and it does like to collapse. Bob shaking his head in affirmation, yes. So that, that's a learning point. Uh, thanks, Jared. So uh, one more quick case, and then we want to switch to our visiting professor. Dr. Slaudroff participated in a challenging case recently. And again, there's a psychosocial element to this without stealing too much of your thunder. Dr. Slaudroff is going to, uh, he's from UPenn, and he's going to go to Idaho and uh, be in a level one trauma center there and do uh, spine and excellent cranial work. All right, so like Dr. Chapman said, complex patient. He's a 46-year-old, uh, recently homeless gentleman for the last year, was previously a boiler maker. Uh, he does no IV drugs, however, he does smoke meth and heroin um, a fair amount, uh, lives in the streets up in Everett. Uh, he had two months of right arm pain, hand pain, numbness, weakness, went to the ED multiple times, but he was dismissed and never had an imaging done. He had no fevers, chills. Uh, on strength wise, you can see that he does have some, uh, some weakness there, uh, predominantly on the right side and distal upper extremity. Reflexes were uh, fairly normal. Uh, he did have some decreased sensation in the, the right arm as well. He did have a leukocytosis, uh, elevated uh, platelets, uh, elevated ESR, CRP, a concern for possible infection originally before they uh, got all the imaging. And here you can see on MRI, uh, you can see an axial T1 GAD uh, showing a, a right-sided pancos like tumor distribution uh, invading uh, three of those vertebra having a pretty significant destruction. Here you can see CT coronal sagittal axial cuts with the right side pancos tumor, essentially removed three of the, his upper ribs and filled the apex of his uh, peripheral space and then had a uh, destruction of three, three vertebra. So SIN score, I calculated a 12. I think you said you calculated a 13. Dr. I said Scott. 13, yeah, it's the but vagary. Overall, I think unstable based on imaging. So again, uh, we can quickly go through this. Go back to the CT. Uh, do you want to talk about this, Dr. Napier, or 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 defer to Tacoma colleagues? Tacoma. All right. One of you guys. Have, so this is obviously something we see. What we can't express in these images, because we don't have an upright X-ray, uh, was the patient's head was basically tilted to the left and toward the cause and forward tilted in a pretty grotesque position. So these are obviously idealized images uh, with him laying supine on the uh, gantry table. But um, there's a substantial mechanical derangement at the cervical thoracic junction over multiple levels. Any thoughts? Again, the same story as before. Uh, do we want to biopsy this first, or do we want to kind of do something surgical given the severity of his malposition? And if uh, how far? Too above, too below? I get interested. That's fine. So I, there, the microphone. Yeah, I get close. There's a, there's a lytic uh, lesion uh, in, in the mid and upper thoracic spine uh, with uh, obvious mechanical instability. There's a significant coronal and sagittal deformity. Uh, the patient doesn't have uh, uh, major neurologic deficit or cord level symptoms uh, at this point, but there's clearly mechanical instability. I think it's uh, very similar to the previous case presented where uh, we'd like to get as much information as we can as soon as possible regarding the, the nature uh, of, of the cells of interest here. Uh, however, it's, it's clear that he'll need reconstruction and stabilization um, uh, uh, of the anterior column, and, and that should, should be done in order to facilitate mobilization. All right. So take us forwards in the interest of time. So he ended up, we did a, uh, a three-level corpectomy from right side approach, uh, end up doing a peak cage because he's probably can get radiation at some point. And then I uh, used a bone cement as well uh, to reconstruct the anterior column and then did a, a C2 T7 posterior fixation. Uh, frozen came back, non-smell cell lung, uh, final path came back just when I looked at it, uh, poorly differentiated squamous cell. So it's a lung cancer. We use that cement as kind of a barrier towards the um, pulmonary disease or the, the chest cavity disease. So we resected that into a margin and then filled that cavity with uh, PMMA with vancomycin in there. Um, and the, the point for me was, uh, again, this is a psychosocially very uh, vulnerable patient. Uh, we did a pretty extensive surgery, C2 to C7. Any argument on the numbers of levels, uh, Bob? I mean, 
when you had the yeah, microphone here, should we have gone less? Would less have worked? Yeah, it's 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 hard to know, right? Uh, but I don't think it's unreasonable. I certainly think the distal fixation. I would have done at least as much as that. Um, and you know, this gentleman. I mean, this construct needs to last as long as he does. And obviously, this is a much more aggressive cancer situation than the prior patient. Uh, so uh, I think you have you know, given him a construct that will last to the end of his life, and, and I wouldn't argue with the endpoints. We were actually, despite this uh, uh, destitute situation, uh, pleased how rapidly he mobilized and got out of here. It's actually very surprising. It's, uh, he kind of rekeyed some of his social uh, um, backup systems uh, into place again, but uh, I was pleasantly surprised how rapidly we got him out of here, how, how long his life lasts and what he goes uh, for next in terms of treatment, uh, we'll have to see. But the, the goal of returning him to a, at least semi-independent quality of life uh, was certainly met. And again, we preserved the T1 route. We did not ligate that. We ligated T2, T3. Blood loss, Abe, how bad was the blood loss? Uh, fairly reasonable, maybe like 500. It was not a bloody tumor. It was yeah. more of one of those fibrodus tumors, not yeah. like a renal or something like that. We did a single midline approach and we basically, again, for me, the point here is we can do a lot posterolaterally nowadays. And if we can sacrifice nerve roots safely, which we're able to do here without the loss of the, for the patient, um, I think it's an underutilized approach. We think so much about lateral and anterior approaches and anterior column reconstruction is rightfully very heavily emphasized now. But again, just with standard posterior and posterolateral techniques, we can actually accomplish a lot. Uh, Abe, what would you do in your practice in Idaho next year or this year? Yeah, I think something similar. So Rod, I'd do probably the same. Same for the corpactomy. I'm not sure how long of a construct I would have done, uh, but he's he's a complex patient. He's Rod. Should we have gone to C two? Would C six have sufficed? Um, so we talked about this case, and it's a difficult case, and I think it ended up being lung, lung cancer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or or lung cancer, squamous cell, squamous. Yeah, I mean, lung. these these are tough cases because you know you make an argument to not do anything, right? I mean, that's also an option. So, but I do think that if you're going to do something, I don't think you can do something small. I think you have to do either go big or or do nothing. That's my opinion. All right, so far so good. Hopefully he will not come back to an ER with a, a, a wound dehiscence or a resounding infection. We did a very thorough multi-tiered closure. Great uh, honor to introduce our guest speaker today, Dr. Zachary Matias Napier from Roseville, California from the Sierra Spine Institute. Uh, and he's going to talk about something new and that is uh, simultaneous prone far lateral surgeries, which is an exciting new venture in reconstructing anterior columns. We showed a couple of the intricacies and difficulties. I want to thank our fellows for their case presentations, by the way. I think they're very helpful. I hope you'll find agree. Dr. Napier comes from uh, uh, Hawaii and he's done an all-American, very cool educational pathway. Sadly, he did not do a fellowship here, but he attended Dartmouth. Um, uh, for his undergrad in math. Um, he went to George Washington University School of Medicine for his uh, MD. He did the Cedars Orthopedic Residency uh, in LA, and he did the Harvard Combined Spine Surgery Fellowship uh, with an all-star cast of uh, faculty. And he's now practicing in California, and he's one of those uh, young guns who's uh, eminently bright and who's opened uh, the doors for new um, and exciting advances. So we are interested in learning from you about uh, prone position surgery. Thanks for coming here in person. All right. Well, thank you for that introduction, uh, Dr. Chapman, and good morning. My name is Zach Napier. I'm an orthopedic spine surgeon in private practice in Northern California. Seattle Science Foundation has been a valuable educational resource for me throughout my training and in my clinical practice. The quality of content hosted on this platform is truly outstanding, and it is an honor to return here as a presenter. My talk today is titled Prone Trans Soas PTP Lateral Inner Body Fusion. Tips and tricks for successful adoption. 
Dr. Chapman covered uh, my background listed are my disclosures with relevant relationships bolded. Atex Spine manufactures many of the implants shown and the surgical positioners, retractors, and neuromonitoring equipment demonstrated in this talk. Today we will cover a general background on prone trans psoas, followed by a discussion of indications, my experience, technical tips, and as well as case presentations. The advantages of lateral inner body fusion are well documented and broadly fall into two categories, general advances, advantages of minimally invasive inner body fusion and specific advantages of lateral inner body fusion. In general, minimally invasive inner body fusion techniques with relative, relative preservation of the posterior musculoligamentous complex will result in less blood loss, faster recovery, and less postoperative pain. Specific benefits of lateral inner body fusion include an optimized fusion environment with a large mechanically stable graft placed in compression, the size of the lateral inner body cage, as well as its ability to span the dense apophyseal ring contribute to increased construct stiffness and decreased rates of subsidence. A wide lateral annular release results in substantial indirect decompression of the neural foramen and lateral recess. Traditionally, lateral inner body fusion in the lateral decubitus position provided significant coronal correction and only modest sagittal correction. This led to the development of anterior column release for cases that required greater sagittal correction. Despite over 20 years of refinement, significant challenges exist regarding adoption of lateral inner body fusion in the lateral decubitus position. These include an unfamiliar setup with labor intensive initial positioning as well as repositioning to the prone position. Although surgeons are certainly able to perform single position lateral decubitus surgery, this can be logistically cumbersome compromising accuracy of screw placement and making direct decompression very difficult to perform. Additional, additionally, lordosis is not maximized in the lateral decubitus position compared to the prone position. Other challenges include either direct or traction related lumbar plexus injury and difficulty with access at L45 or more cephalad levels. Prone trans psoas inner body fusion has the following advantages. A single position that is familiar to all spine surgeons. This is an easy setup that generally does not require the surgeon to be in the room. No repositioning is required for direct decompression or other posterior work. The surgeon is able to work simultaneously or alternately on the posterior and anterior aspects of the spine with relative fluidity. We will show some examples where this is useful. Prone position uses gravity to induce greater lordosis than lateral decubitus. Hip extension draws the psoas and with it the lumbar plexus posteriorly for an increased safe zone anterior to the plexus. And finally, coronal bending improves access to L45 in the setting of a high iliac crest as well as L12 underneath the 12th rib. This access is also improved by working through the side of a two-bladed retractor designed specifically for prone lateral surgery. This is an animation demonstrating the coronal bending feature. The patient is strapped into rigid patient positioners which enable coronal rotation of both the pelvis and the ribs for increased access. These images demonstrate the effect of coronal bending. In the image on the left, before coronal bending, a horizontal line drawn from the left iliac crest intersects the L4 vertebral body. After coronal bending, this line intersects the L4-5 disc space. The pictures on the right demonstrate increased access working outside the retractor. Although an angled inserter is used in the image on the right, it is often not necessary due to the ability of the surgeon to work through the side of the two-bladed retractor. I've included a few relevant articles that I will summarize briefly. This is a study of healthy volunteers positioned in lateral decubitus with table breaking versus prone position with coronal bending. Prone, coronally bent conditions provided better accessibility as measured by the vertical distance between the iliac crest and L5 end plate. 
All prone positions in this study showed statistically significant lumbar lordosis improvement versus the lateral decubitus position. This MRI study demonstrates that the psoas shifts posteriorly with hip extension and prone positioning. In this cadaveric study, the femoral nerve was marked with radiopaque paint, which demonstrated a larger safe zone at the L45 disc space. The nerve was located at approximately the 40 yard line in the lateral decubitus position and the 30 yard line in the prone position. PTP can be used Zach, in the- can you go back yeah. one slide? No problem. So, um, uh, so go over that for me one more time. Go so the, what happens to the femoral nerve? Yes, yeah, so uh, basically if you look at the L45 disc space as a uh, football field, uh -huh. uh, in the lateral decubitus position, it will be in a more anterior station. And so your corridor uh, is going to be anterior to the nerve and behind the vessels. So in the prone position, uh, the nerve will actually move to the 30 yard line, giving us basically 10 more yards of, of field to play on. So what happens, so, in the, so if you're prone, then you're um, extending your hip. Yeah, the, the thought is and that then your hip plexus extension is moving backwards. Is that what the thought is? Yeah, the, the lesser trochanter, yeah. uh, the insertion will, will be pulled posteriorly and it will, uh, it will bring the psoas with it. Because, I mean, in my experience, you know, the, the plexus is pretty plastered onto the disc in the, in the plexus. Um, I mean, in the, in the psoas, it's pretty fixed, but it does move a little bit. That's interesting. Um, I don't think I've seen that paper. Uh, yeah, it's a pretty simple paper, yeah. and admittedly, there are only seven cadavers, yeah. but uh, it's it, it's nice because yeah. it's just a, a, a pretty clear takeaway. Um, and, and we'll talk a little bit more uh, experientially mm -hmm. how that may be borne out, but you know, certainly not level one evidence. Yeah. So uh, PTP can be used in the following clinical scenarios and many more. It's become my workhorse for degenerative pathology in the lumbar spine. In terms of my experience, as of February 2023, I've performed 65 prone trans psoas cases, totaling 109 levels. 57% of these cases involved L45. I've also performed four cases and seven levels of retropleural prone lateral fusion. I've had no vascular or bowel injury, no reoperation for hardware malposition, no motor deficit at six weeks post-op. In terms of complications, I've had three inadvertent ALL ruptures recognized intraoperatively and treated with plate fixation, and one air leak with intraoperative chest tube placement. In regard to technique, the same basic principles of lateral surgery must be respected, whether you're in the prone or the lateral decubitus position. Uh, the main steps are developing the retroperitoneal space, mapping and traversing the lumbar plexus, limiting retraction injury, using good carpentry with respect to discectomy and end plate preparation, and appropriate implant selection and placement. I will provide a brief overview of my technique. I was very fortunate to learn this operation from accomplished lateral surgeons and pioneers in the field, including my practice partner, Tyler Smith, and others. I've incorporated their techniques as well as many of my own in a way that works well for me. The prone position is familiar and it maximizes lordosis, but the major drawback is that gravity is no longer bracing your patient's side against the table and it is no longer keeping your shim embedded in the disc space. There will be a tendency for the patient to recoil or bounce and for your shim to piston out of the disc space especially with percussive maneuvers of trialing and implant insertion. The key to positioning is to minimize recoil or bounce of the patient. I achieve this by firmly fixing the patient into the positioners, so when I am doing trialing and percussive work, the patient does not piston away from me. These positioners are specifically designed for prone trans psoas cases and provide excellent stability. Retroperitoneal access is the first critical step of this operation. In the prone position, abdominal girth tends to pancake outward and results in longer retractor lengths than lateral decubitus. Traversing this length blindly can be intimidating, especially early in the learning curve. To convince myself that no viscera or abdominal contents are interposed, I use a technique of direct palpation of known landmarks all the way to the spine. 
I typically use my percutaneous screw incision as an accessory, but you can also use an open midline incision or a dedicated accessory incision. Once you're comfortable, no accessory incision is necessary, but the accessory incision is an excellent way to ensure safe access. I will describe this access technique in greater detail utilizing the percutaneous screw incision as an accessory. The first step is to make your perk screw incision and palpate your pedicle screw start site. Then move laterally toward the tip of the transverse process and enter the retroperitoneal space. You should be able to feel the surface of the psoas medially. Next, make your lateral incision and dissect through the abdominal wall, popping through the transversalis fascia. Clearly demarcate the retroperitoneal space by palpating the inner table of the ilium and the undersurface of the 12th rib. I will make my fingers touch to convince myself that there is a clear pathway from my incision to the psoas. In this image, the finger in the lateral incision can reach the spine, but usually this is not the case. Often, especially early in the learning curve, you will feel material interposed between your fingers. So Zach, you do this on, on uh, lateral and prone? Not on lateral, I don't do any oh, Okay, because I, I mean, we used idea. to do this when we first started doing it. Yeah. Um, but most people don't do it anymore. I don't know. Do you do yeah. it for prone? I do not do it for oh, okay. lateral. Got I it. do it for prone. Oh, you do it for prone. Yeah, because it's a longer distance. Yeah. Uh, and very, very rarely am I only making a lateral incision. Yeah. Um, so I'll have either a perk screw incision that's convenient, or if I'm doing midline work, um, that works as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, because it's a longer working distance, and uh, when, you, when you feel tissue between your fingertips, uh, and you're pretty sure that it's yeah. not bowel, you, you know, you, you have to be totally sure. So um, I, I use the accessory, it's easy to use, you don't have to, but okay. it's, it's probably more relevant in a prone position. Uh, so at, at that point, uh, the, the retroperitoneal access has been established. I will enter the retroperitoneal space uh, through my percutaneous incision, again, to ensure there's no interposed materials. I'll place the dilator now on the known surface of the psoas and advance to the surface of the disc space. So this is a cadaveric demonstration of my retroperitoneal access technique. We start by making the percutaneous pedicle screw incision, bluntly developing the intramuscular plane. I then move my finger laterally, advancing into the retroperitoneal space. I make my lateral incision directly over the disc space of interest and dissect subcutaneous tissues, followed by the layers of the abdominal wall. Often, I can advance my finger directly through the transversalis, but for patients with more robust tissue, I'll take the tip of a Metzenbaum scissor. Once loss of resistance is encountered, I open the Mets to further develop my opening. Then I develop the peritoneal space by touching my fingertips. I use a windshield wiper technique to palpate the inner table of the ilium as well as the 12th rib, making an effort to push the peritoneum anteriorly. I can also directly palpate the psoas with my left finger, which I will use to escort my dilator to the psoas. I protect the tip of my dilator with my right index finger and shepherd the dilator to my left index finger and place it on the surface of the psoas. I typically aim for the anterior one-third, two-third junction of the vertebral body. After mapping the plexus and dilating in the standard fashion, I prefer to use a rigid two-bladed retractor designed specifically for the prone position which has several advantages over a conventional three-bladed retractor typically used in the lateral decubitus position. The two-bladed retractor is inherently more rigid than a three-bladed retractor and allows for placement of an anterior and a posterior shim, which provides significantly more retractor stability than a single posterior shim. This is especially important in the prone position since gravity is no longer keeping your shim anchored in the disc space 
and there is a tendency for the shim to piston out and the retractor to drift anteriorly toward the vessels. The two-bladed retractor also allows me to dock anteriorly, which I will do about 90% of the time. This allows me to keep a greater distance from the plexus, and most of the time at L45, I will have triggered EMG values greater than 12 in all four quadrants. After placing my anterior shim, I'll open the retractor just barely enough to pass 18 millimeter instruments. This minimizes retraction of the psoas and the plexus. I will then place a posterior shim, which establishes an extremely well-fixed and demarcated channel for discectomy. Given the tendency of the retractor to drift anteriorly in the prone position, it is especially comforting to have a firmly anchored anterior shim providing a clear boundary between the operative field and the vessels anteriorly. By contrast, a three-bladed retractor only allows for placement of one posterior shim and requires the use of an ALL retractor to establish a boundary between the operative field and the vessels. In the picture on the bottom left, I've placed an anterior shim, and in the picture on the middle, I've established an operative corridor that is just large enough to allow passing of the 18 millimeter instrument. The picture on the bottom right shows an appropriately sized operative corridor, which is just big enough to fit the 18 millimeter trial with rigid fixation provided by anterior and posterior shims. I will also be monitoring saphenous SSEP throughout the case to detect stretch injury. As the saphenous is a terminal branch of the femoral nerve, it may serve as a canary in the coal mine for impending plexus injury. <clears throat> Once I like my position on the surface of the psoas, I will advance my dilator through the psoas onto the disc space and confirm my position with fluoroscopy. I'll then advance my guide wire, anchoring the dilator in place. Directional triggered EMG allows me to map the plexus and establish a safe anterior corridor to the disc space. Low EMG readings indicate close proximity to the plexus. I prefer high numbers in every direction, indicating that I am far from nerves, but I'm fine with low numbers in the posterior direction indicating that I am anterior to the plexus. If I have low numbers both anteriorly and posteriorly, this is not acceptable as I am in an axilla and I must start over with a more anterior start site or more anterior to posterior trajectory through the psoas. I also use this opportunity to measure my retractor length and make sure I feel the surface of the disc with each dilator. Next is retractor insertion. This is a rigid two-blade retractor with independent blade motion and various visual indicators to confirm orthogonality in multiple planes. I open the retractor slightly and remove my dilators to obtain a lateral x-ray to confirm appropriate position. I then stimulate my proposed shim insertion site insert the shim to the surface of the disc space, and switch to AP fluoroscopy to confirm trajectory. I will also raise the table to eye level to maintain orthogonality. Once my anterior shim is inserted, I want to establish my operative field as small as possible while being able to pass 18 millimeter instruments. I will use an 18 millimeter trial to ensure smooth passage without an excessively large field. I will then stimulate my proposed posterior shim insertion site before placing the posterior shim on AP fluoroscopy. When the shims are perfectly superimposed, we can be confident that stable disc access has been achieved and we are ready to start the discectomy. The discectomy becomes very simple once two shims have been placed, establishing a rigid orthogonal operative corridor. Once discectomy is completed, I typically take a shot with my trial and decide whether to remove the anterior or posterior shim before placing a 22 millimeter implant. In this case on the bottom left, there's a well-placed 18 millimeter trial 
and I elected to remove the posterior shim and place a 22 millimeter implant. Five minutes. Can you do five minutes? Uh, probably like ten. Do how much time do you need? Probably ten minutes from now. Ten or fifteen. Yeah. Okay. The discectomy starts with an annulotomy knife, followed by the passage of a small cob elevator to separate any remaining cartilaginous end plate. Um, I'll, I'll go through the, uh, we're running a little short on time, so I may just abridge the, the discectomy portion. It's fairly standard technique, um, using a box cutter, uh, removing the discectomy and, and placing our cage. So these clips were taken uh, from a more complete technique, technique video that is available online. Uh, with the remaining time, I'd like to share some cases. That's good. probably about five, five to 10 minutes of these. Yep. Um, so first case, uh, this is an 84-year-old male with persistent lower back pain and radicular pain and weakness after an L45 laminectomy and posterior spinal fusion at an outside hospital. Imaging demonstrated adjacent segment degeneration at L3-4 with foraminal stenosis, as well as a pseudarthrosis at L4-5. I placed the patient in the prone position, made bilateral Wiltsy incisions to remove his rods. I then did PTP laterals at L4-5 and L3-4 before placing percutaneous pedicle screws bilaterally. We had minimal blood loss, less than two hours of total operative time, and the patient was ambulating within hours of surgery. In this case, I was able to use a simultaneous posterior and lateral workflow and avoid working through a revision laminectomy bed. The next case, and this is pretty similar to our first uh, case this morning, it's a very active 59-year-old uh, CrossFit enthusiast, mother of seven, who was referred to me by her physical therapist. She had lower back, radicular pain, and quad weakness with imaging, imaging demonstrating L45 anterolisthesis. In her case, there was about 15 millimeters of bony overlap, um, and the smallest lateral cage is 18 millimeters. So I used a screws first uh, reduction technique. So in the prone position, I placed my perk screws. I did a provisional reduction with reduction towers, uh, which allowed me enough overlap to place my inner body cage. Then I uh, completed the reduction, um, and there are the final x-rays. She's about one year out now, uh, and she's doing great. And so I think if you can pull this off, that's the best way, in my opinion, to approach the clinical scenario that you described. Uh, but there are factors uh, that, that you must consider, anatomical factors, including overlap of vertebra as well as uh, plexus and vascular anatomy. This is a great case to illustrate indirect decompression. In the image in the upper left, you can see the inferior articular process of L4 in the lateral recess completely reduced postoperatively. Next case is a 63-year-old railroad mechanic, lower back and radicular plane and quad weakness. Unfortunately, her MRI cuts were not aligned with the disc space. I find the multiplanar uh, CT reconstruction very helpful to delineate the psoas and vascular anatomy. In this case, there's an anterior station psoas, and this is what we would describe as our Mickey Mouse anatomy. This has been a relative contraindication uh, two lateral inner body fusion. In this case, I consented the patient for prone lateral with the T-lift equipment on backup. So initially I tried to approach and was getting two millimeters in all directions without a safe anterior corridor. I used a technique of rotating the patient away from me by 30 degrees, uh, which allowed me a more anterior access channel. And I was able to place my inner body in a standard fashion and reduce the spondylolisthesis. So the next case, uh, this is an adjacent segment case, um, a 70 year old heavy equipment operator with severe lower back pain, postural fatigue and leg weakness. He had a history of an L2 to 5 T-lift in 2009. Imaging demonstrated a focal thoracolumbar kyphosis of 34 degrees from T11 to L2 uh, with a misplaced screw at L45. I approached this case in a staged fashion. First, I placed a hyperlordotic A-lift at L5-S1, followed by three 15-degree lateral cages through a prone retropleural approach. 
By resecting a six centimeter fragment of rib, I was able to clearly approach three disc spaces. Couldn't find a dedicated illustration for this approach in the literature, so I borrowed and rotated this one from Dr. Uribe, who's done significant work in defining and describing lateral thoracic and thorac thoracolumbar junctional anatomy. This is the same view of my operative corridor, with the only difference being a rigid two-bladed retractor described earlier. On the second stage, I did a T4 to pelvis. Maybe I could have stopped in lower thoracic, but his PI was borderline, and I thought the PJK risk was too high, especially with the amount of junctional kyphosis he had. This is an example of using PTP and hyperlordotic ALIF to achieve sagittal correction infusion through the anterior column. He's now one year out with improvement in his sagittal profile. Next patient is a 63-year-old who presented with lower back radicular pain, postural fatigue, and foot drop. She had a degenerative scoliosis, osteopenia, a relatively low pelvic incidence. I started with a four-level PTP. As you can see in the images, the coronal bending feature of the patient positioner provided an excellent provisional reduction of the scoliosis. For this cage, I used 10 degree implants rather than my preferred 15 because I didn't trust her bone and the sagittal balance wasn't bad. I finished with a lower thoracic to pelvis instrumentation and fusion with no direct decompression other than a T-lift at L5S1 for stability. She's now four months out with improvement in her preoperative symptoms. Last but not least, one of my own complications, this is an 87-year-old woman who presented with pseudarthrosis after I did an L45 laminectomy and posterior spinal fusion for spondylolisthesis one year prior. The MRI demonstrated a narrow corridor anterior to the plexus. I was able to work simultaneously, first opening her posterior incision and removing the rod, then placing a PTB in her body before replacing the rods. Surgery took less than an hour with immediate symptomatic improvement. She went home the next day, and now she's four months out with no complaints other than, why didn't I do that surgery the first time? <laughs> yeah, nice. So when do I not use PTP? Anytime the patient needs direct anterior canal decompression, or I feel like I need improved anterior visualization, such as an ACR or corpectomy, some of this has to do with two versus three bladed retractor design, and this may change soon with retractor innovation. This is a summary slide comparing lateral decubitus and prone techniques. In terms of setup, direct posterior work, and canal decompression, the advantage clearly goes to prone. Lateral has the advantage for direct anterior canal decompression. Simultaneous or alternate posterior work is easily performed in the prone position. The prone position results in more lordosis than lateral, and neural complications and access may be better. There are many exciting research projects ongoing that will help us to more clearly delineate the role of each technique in order to best serve our patients. In conclusion, traditional lateral decubitus and PTP are both very good techniques. Rather than think of these operations as rivals, I think of them as a complementary tool set. In many ways, PTP is a natural evolution of lateral inner body fusion. It has become my workhorse approach for degenerative lumbar pathology, and there are exciting applications forthcoming for more complex surgery. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Nice job, Zach. Thank you. Yeah. So my, my first question to you is, uh, if you can go back to one of those lumbar plexus shots. So you showed very nice uh, videos, how you navigate and use neuromodeling, live neuromodeling that you observe uh, uh, where as to where the plexus is. And uh, again, I got to credit my partner, Dr. Oskui, and I sent him a lot of um, far lateral approach patients. And he's had, I think, two patients over the eight, nine years we've worked yeah. together where he canceled the far lateral inner bodies because he said, I, I cannot find a safe corridor. How often has this happened in your case? Yeah, that, that's happened to me one time. And that was on an, an extreme Mickey Mouse where I was... I didn't think it was going to work, and, and I, I told that to the patient, and she uh, still consented for me to, to try. Um, and so it, that's the only time it's happened to me. Uh, yeah. Granted, I don't have Dr. Schoon's experience, uh, but I think there is something about the prone position that makes it safer and uh, the corridor a little more accessible. 
Um, and there are techniques and maneuvers you can use to essentially sneak in front of, of the psoas from a prone position. I want to not hog the microphone. Do you want yeah. to go no, ahead? I mean, I think this is, a, I think you did a great job presenting, um, Zach. I think, you know, I agree with you. I think, um, you know, when you go to, we just had our advanced lateral course recently, and there's a lot of debate and some people on, on the lateral, you know, versus prone lateral camps. And I think they're complementary. I think it's a natural evolution of the procedure. And I'm excited. You know, I think uh, just that whole area. I remember when I started doing lateral, there wasn't even codes or inner body, you know, devices, neuro monitoring. Um, all that stuff is really it's um, it's evolved. And I, I'm excited. I think there's a. There's a lot. Of, there's a lot to learn, and there's a lot of scientific as well as um, clinical data to be collected. So, great job on uh, presenting. Um, I'll pass the microphone on to our Tacoma colleagues. Um, so, you're experienced practitioners. Uh, sorry, I have to excuse myself in a second. Are you comfortable doing this now? What would it take for you to kind of make that jump to a prone position surgery? Uh, uh, a course, at least, in. Uh, you know, doing a couple of cases with somebody who's uh, got some experience. Um, currently, uh, I'm not doing any, uh, but it's intriguing. I like this concept better than uh, lateral decubitus. So uh, definitely interested. Well, I'm convinced. Are you going to do uh, prone OLIF procedures? I don't want to say a company's name here. Uh, you know, I, I do think there uh, seem to be some advantages to doing it in the prone position. I have not done that in my own OR yet. I have evaluated some of the uh, some of the retractors and, and positioning equipment and uh, implants that make that um, more uh, more or make that possible. Um, I've already said I, I really am a believer in uh, in a percutaneous lateral approach. However, that's done. Uh, so I, I certainly think that's been transformative. And the last comment I wanted to make, uh, since we still do have a few of the fellows here, is you know I, I'd applaud your uh, your radiographs, the radiographic uh, results you're getting. And um, you know I think as we evolve uh, as a specialty into more limited access type approaches, which I think we all recognize is where things are headed, um, it's important that we continue to. Uh, uh, sort of adhere to the principles of spine surgery. And I try to make sure that every fellow has those memorized by the time they finish their time here. But I won't call anybody out today, but to repeat, those are uh, the biology of bone fusion, the anatomy of decompression, neural decompression, the anatomy of spinal alignment, and uh, the biomechanics of fixation. And I, particularly the case you showed with the deformity, I thought you got a very nice result uh, with respect to the alignment and with the uh, extent of the fixation. And certainly uh, we see cases that fail because their practitioner has, uh, has kind of taken uh, technique over uh, these fundamental principles. And I'll stop with that. And other than that, I have no strong oh, opinion. Yeah, can I, can I just reply to Dr. Hart? Uh, thank you for mentioning that. And I couldn't agree with you more. Don't do MIS just because you think it's cool or you want to make a small incision or, or, or operate on someone in a surgery center. That's the wrong reasons to do it. Uh, you want to do it because you're preserving soft tissues. Uh, and if you're able to achieve just as good or better sagittal results, uh, better decompression results, better stabilization results, then do it. Don't don't do an inferior surgery just because it's a quote MIS, and that's that's a principle I always keep in my mind when doing these cases. Yeah, we have an acronym for what Dr. Hart's uh, describing here. As orthopedic surgeons, we're all familiar with the term ORIF, open reduction internal fixation, and with MIS we see a lot of OIF, open internal don't, fixation. Don't, don't OIF the spine. The the reduction <laughs> the reduction part was omitted. So. And the reductionist approach of MIS, it's become OIF, and that's a rich field of unfortunate revision surgery. So, but thank you. This is a very nicely illustrated and uh, nice case selection uh, based uh, presentation. So, thanks for sharing it. Thanks for coming up. Great to have you here. A lot of fun. Take thank care. you. Really thank appreciate you. it, guys. Thanks. Great job, Zach. Thank you. And I'm supposed to say hi to you from Dr. Uh, Skaggs, and I'll not tell you what he wanted me to do to you. I'll give you a handshake. Okay, great. <laughs>